FCC Commissioner Terrell McSweeney says cramming or unauthorized third-party charges on wireless bills is a growing problem and that the majority who are victims don't even know about it because they look like normal charges. He appeared before the Senate Commerce Committee recently, also testifying Vermont's Attorney General. Senator Richard Blumenthal chaired this hour 40-minute hearing. This hearing is open and uh, as you know, my name is uh, Richard Blumenthal. I'm senator from Connecticut and I am here regretfully in place of Chairman Rockefeller who has a, an urgent intel, intelligence matter and therefore could not be with us at the opening. I don't think he'll be able to join us, but uh, his absence is in no way a sign of any lack of interest in this subject. In fact, I've talked to him in some detail about this hearing, and I know that he would be here if he could be. Uh, I want to welcome uh, all of our panel here and all of the folks who are attending. Uh, this subject is one very, very close to my heart as a former Attorney General for a couple of decades in Connecticut. I had first-hand experience with cramming, both wireless and landline, and worked with at least one of the members of this panel, Attorney General Sorrell, and I'll be introducing him in just a moment. Uh, as many of you know, more than two decades ago, the telephone industry decided to get into the payment processing business. Uh, the bright idea was that consumers could charge purchases to their phone bills rather than doing it through a credit card or a bank account. At the end of every billing period, consumers would pay for their telephone service plus the purchases they'd made from third-party vendors. In theory, using a telephone bill as a way to purchase goods and services makes some sense, has a lot of potential, and attracted a lot of interest. As several of our witnesses point out in their testimony today, and they do it very well, the so-called direct carrier billing method of payment could benefit unbanked customers and other people looking for an alternative way to shop or make a charitable contribution. But the reality of third-party charges on telephone bills is a markedly different story, a profoundly different tail and the fact of the matter is that it hasn't lived up to its potential almost as soon as the telephone companies opened up their payment platforms to outside party scammers figured out a way to beat the system not surprisingly they found ways to cram unauthorized charges onto consumers bills and they've been absolutely relentless in doing so so today most consumers still do not understand including some of my colleagues that their phone bills have often contained charges for things they never actually bought. It's a surprise. They are paying for things they never bought. And it is an unwelcome surprise to them, especially when they discover that they have trouble getting refunds or that they can't get their money back at all. In the 1990s and into the 2000s, most cramming occurred on consumers' wireline, wire line telephone bills, as this committee documented in an excellent 2011 hearing and report, American consumers and businesses paid billions of dollars for fax, voicemail, celebrity gossip, and other services they didn't want and didn't order. A few days ago, the crammers very predictably turned their attention, I should have said a few years ago, the crammers very predictably turned their attention to the rapidly growing wireless telephone market. They figured out a way to rip consumers off who had grown accustomed to purchasing music and other content on their phones through a text messaging based system called PSMS, Premium Short Messaging System. The Commerce Committee staff, uh, and I really want to thank them for their excellent work, has prepared a new report documenting how crammers exploited 
the weaknesses in the premium messaging system to fraudulently charge American consumers literally hundreds of millions of dollars. And I ask uh, unanimous consent uh, to put this report and its exhibits in the record of this hearing. Both this report and the committee's earlier report on landline cramming make it abundantly clear that telephone carriers were not doing enough to protect their consumers from fraud. The key question is whether they're doing enough now. The carriers gave third party access to their customers' bills, collected their cut, and then failed to make sure that the third parties were acting honestly. The massive fraud we've documented in these reports happened right under the telephone company's noses. In the cases of both wireline and wireless cramming, the telephone companies had plenty of notice that crammers were placing fraudulent charges on their customers' bills. Thousands of consumers complained to both the companies and to state and federal law enforcement agencies about this problem. And I know I received a lot of those complaints. I'm sure that the FTC and uh, Attorney General Sorrells and my colleagues did as well. The Federal Trade Commission and Attorneys General brought case after case, enforcement action after enforcement action against crammers. When confronted with evidence of widespread fraud in their billing systems, the telephone carriers promised to tighten their rules and do a better job of protecting customers. But then the crammers seemed to go back to business as usual. The telephone companies acted decisively only after the evidence of fraud became overwhelming and undeniable. In 2011, the major wireless carriers agreed to end third-party billing. And in November of 2013, less than a year ago, the four major wireless carriers, AT&T, Sprint, T-Mobile, and Verizon, agreed to end third-party PSMS billing. Don't get me wrong, I don't think the telephone companies were happy or content that crammers were defrauding their customers. They, but they almost certainly welcomed the revenue that third party billing was generating for them. The committee staff report released today found that the wireless carriers received 30 to 40% 30 to 40 percent of each charge that third parties placed on their customers' bill through PSMS. For every $9.99 monthly charge placed on a bill, the carriers kept three to four dollars. Their financial incentive to allow third party billing seems to conflict with their responsibility to protect their customers from fraud. They may not have been happy about it, but the fraud sure benefited them. While the telephone carriers have discontinued certain types of third-party billing, their systems are still open for business. As we will hear today, the carriers are experimenting with new direct carrier billing techniques. I hope we will not be sitting here in several months or several years and discussing how they, too, failed to protect consumers from fraud. The time for effective action is now. The notice has been abundant that consumers are suffering, and I hope that these new measures will be truly effective. I am now uh, happy to yield to the ranking member, Senator Thune. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing to discuss the unauthorized charges on uh, mobile phone bills and the findings of uh, the chairman's wireless exam or cramming investigation. I commend the chairman and his staff for shining a light on these abuses. I understand, uh, Senator Blumenthal, that you're graciously uh, filling in for him today, and I uh, appreciate that. Mobile payments are a growing way for consumers to pay for goods and services. Third-party billing is one way that consumers can take advantage of new technologies and consumer uh, customer conveniences. There are legitimate uses for this manner of billing. For instance, consumers can provide money to charity, support a political cause, or download the newest song or app. 
and, uh, and bill the purchase directly to their mobile telephone bill. Yet despite the industry efforts to implement protections and state and federal regulations in place to prevent cramming, unscrupulous actors have been able to game the system to take advantage of third-party phone billing. Of course, cramming is not a new phenomenon. In the late 1990s, Congress devoted a lot of time and attention to the issue of cramming on landline phone bills. This committee held a hearing on that issue again in 2011, highlighting the chairman's investigation into cramming on landline phone bills and demonstrating the persistence of the problem. Some states have enacted laws to limit third-party billing in an effort to prevent cramming on landline phones, and most of the major phone carriers have ended most types of third-party billing on landline phone bills. More recently, however, concerns have been raised about fraud on wireless phone bills, the topic of today's hearing and the chairman's more recent investigation. There are three key parties involved in placing third-party charges on consumers' wireless phone bills. The third-party content provider, the billing aggregator, and the phone carrier. From what I've seen, there are some content providers and even some aggregators that appear to be bad actors, but all of the parties involved could do more to protect consumers from cramming. While cramming has been identified as a problem, it's uh, been challenging to accurately measure how many consumers have been affected by cramming. I appreciate that the wireless carriers and their association, CTIA, have taken a number of actions to prevent cramming of third-party charges on wireless phone bills. Significantly, this past November, the carriers decided to end most so-called premium SMS programs, which build customers for text messages related to topics like daily horoscopes and sports alerts. In addition, at least one carrier has recently decided to end browser-based direct carrier billing. These steps show the carriers treat this issue seriously, but we'll be asking whether they should do more. At the same time, it's important to underscore the extraordinary innovation and economic dynamism in the wireless communication space. The owners of approximately 188 million smartphones in this country spend more time with their mobile devices each day than they do going online with a laptop or a PC. While we must strive to protect consumers from fraud, we must also make sure that we do so in a way that does not stifle innovation. I look forward to hearing from CTIA, who is here today representing the wireless carriers, to discuss how the industry is working to address these issues. I also look forward to hearing from FTC Commissioner McSweeney, who is here for the first time since her confirmation. Uh, Mr. LeBlanc, uh, Mr. LeBlanc of the FCC and Attorney General Sorrell. Uh, the FTC, FCC, and State Attorneys General play a key role in fighting cramming with their law enforcement's efforts and by educating consumers about carrier billing. I also want to thank the South Dakota Public Utilities Commission and the South Dakota Attorney General, Marty Jackley, for their work in this area to better protect consumers. One recent government survey found that the Midwest is the most wireless con connected region in the country, with 44% of Midwesterners living in cell phone only homes. This underscores the importance of my to my constituents, I should say, of addressing wireless cramming. This hearing presents a good opportunity to recognize the good that everyone at the witness table is already doing to combat cramming. Industry, Congress, federal agencies, and state attorneys general all need to continue to work together on this issue to ensure that consumers are informed and protected against bad actors. I want to thank our witnesses for appearing here today, and I look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very, very much, Senator Thune. Uh, I will introduce the witnesses, and then we'll hear from you in this order. Uh, first of all, welcome to Commissioner McSweeney, your first appearance uh, since you're swearing in in April of this year. Prior to joining the commission, uh, Commissioner McSweeney served as chief counsel for competition policy and an intergovernmental relations for the United States Department of Justice Antitrust Division. She has a long and distinguished career in public service, serving as a deputy assistant to the president and domestic policy advisor to the vice president, and a number of other positions in public service where she has significant experience in areas of competition and antitrust, as well as women's rights, domestic violence, judicial nominations, immigration, and civil rights. She's a graduate of the Harvard, of Harvard University and Georgetown University Law School. Uh, General Sorrell has served in uh, Vermont as the Attorney General there since uh, I'm trying to remember in June of 1997. 1997. I knew it was about 13 years that we served together. Uh, and uh, before that, he was a prosecutor and distinguished law enforcement officer. 
He received the uh, National Association of Attorney General Kelly Wyman Award given annually to the Outstanding Attorney General and served as president of that organization for a year between 2004 and 2005. He is a graduate of the University of Notre Dame, magna cum laude, and Cornell Law School. And I know he lo knows a lot about this subject because I've worked with him on it and appreciate your being with us today. Uh, Travis LeBlanc, who is the acting chief of the Enforcement Bureau of the Federal Communications Commission, is a graduate of Princeton University and the Yale Law School, among other institutions, and has served before his present position in the California Attorney General's Office as Special Assistant Attorney General in charge of the uh, Enforcement Bureau. Uh, I'm sorry, as um, Special Assistant Attorney General in charge of technology, high tech crime, privacy, antitrust, and health care issues. And he also advised the California Attorney General on significant appellate and constitutional matters. Mr. Uh, Altschul, uh, Michael Altschul, is Senior Vice President and General Counsel of CTIA, the Wireless Association. Uh, he has served in that capacity since September of 1990, if I'm not mistaken, and was a trial attorney in the Antitrust Division of the United States Department of Justice between 1980 and 1990. Before then, he was in private practice. He's a graduate of Colgate University and New York University Law School. We welcome you all. We thank you for all of your public service. All of you have been involved in public service. And uh, if we can begin with you, Commissioner McSweeney. Thank you very much, Senator Blumenthal, Ranking Member Thune, and Senator Johnson for inviting me here today. I'm Terrell McSweeney, and I am the newest member of the Federal Trade Commission. I appreciate the opportunity to appear here today and also the leadership that this committee has shown on mobile cramming and indeed on, on cramming generally. I also want to thank the other witnesses for their perspectives and for the collaboration the Federal Trade Commission has received from the Federal Communications Commission and State's Attorney General in addressing this important consumer protection issue. For more than 15 years, the Commission has been working with Congress to stop fraudsters that place unauthorized charges on consumers' telephone bills. The FTC began targeting landline cramming in the late 1990s and since then has brought more than 30 cases resulting in hundreds of millions of dollars in judgments. As consumers have migrated to smartphones and mobile payment systems, we have turned our attention to the problem of unauthorized charges on mobile phone accounts. Mobile cramming scams can take a variety of forms. Sometimes consumers are tricked into subscribing for services by third-party merchants who use false pretenses to collect their telephone numbers, such as promises of free concert tickets or $1,000 gift cards. In other cases, consumers are targeted by deceptive ads. In one example, consumers were targeted with an ad for virus protection software for their phone and instead were subscribed to ringtones for $9.99 a month. Generally, these unauthorized subscriptions are automatically renewed and the charges for them are racked up month after month. Frequently, consumers are unaware that they are being billed for third-party services because charges are often difficult to locate on phone bills, and it is rarely clear that they are unassociated with phone service. And many consumers who have prepaid accounts or auto-pay bills do not receive bills at all or may not routinely inspect them. Since the spring of 2013, the Federal Trade Commission has brought six enforcement actions aimed at combating these types of mobile cramming scams. We have obtained stipulated orders in three of these matters with judgments totaling more than $160 million. Earlier this month, the Trade Commission announced our first case against a telecommunications company, T-Mobile. In that case, the FTC is alleging that T-Mobile deceptively described cramming charges on phone bills and unfairly continued to charge customers even after it became aware of telltale signs that charges were unauthorized. These enforcement actions reinforce that basic consumer protections apply in the mobile environment, just as they do in the brick and mortar world. Along with our law enforcement efforts, the Commission has engaged with industry and consumer advocates and developed recommendations to better protect consumers while enabling innovation and access to mobile payment systems. 
In a report issued this week, the Commission staff recommends carrier and industry participants take the following additional steps to reduce fraud and improve reliability of mobile carrier billing. First, they should make it clear to customers and consumers that they can block all third-party charges on their accounts if they wish to. Second, they should ensure that advertising, marketing, and opt-in processes for third-party charges are not deceptive. Third, they should take action when refund requests, complaints, and other factors indicate a merchant is cramming unauthorized charges. Fourth, they should clearly delineate third-party charges on bills. And fifth, the industry should implement effective and consistent dispute resolution for consumers who wish to dispute charges or obtain refunds. As consumers increasingly turn to their mobile phones as payment mechanisms, it is critical that carriers and other industry participants proactively address mobile cramming. Unfortunately, crammers have been able to come up with creative and evolving ways to harm consumers. That is why the FTC remains committed to working with this committee and with members of Congress and our state and federal partners, such as the state attorney generals and the Federal Communications Commission, to continue our efforts to shut down scammers as they appear. I am pleased to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner. General Sorrell. Senator Blumenthal, Ranking Member Thune, uh, thank you for inviting me to be here today to part uh, participate in this hearing and to speak from the perspective of the uh, state AGs. Uh, I do want to make clear that although Vermont is the lead state in a 47 state effort right now to combat wireless cramming, that I'm speaking only on behalf of uh, myself today. Uh, it was over 10 years ago that Vermont started addressing the problem of landline uh, cramming. And our focus was on the third party providers and not on the carriers, but from enforcement actions and, and uh, settlements, we've recouped uh, for 25,000 Vermonters over uh, $2 million in refunds. If you want to take Vermont at two-tenths of one percent of the U.S. population and look at that nationally, just from the companies that we looked at and have settled with that would be over 125 million Americans and over a billion dollars lost to uh, landline cramming. And that's just from those companies that, that we've taken action against. Uh, ultimately, self-regulation, we realized, did not work in the landline cramming arena. And our state legislature banned essentially all uh, third-party charges on landlines. And then about three years ago, our office with other AGs turned uh, to the wireless arena. Uh, and, but instead of going at the third party providers, we focused on the four large uh, cell phone or wireless carriers. And we conducted a survey in Vermont involving all Vermonters with third party charges on their cell phone bills on the part of two large carriers over a two-month period in the summer of 2012. We retained the University of Vermont Center for Rural Studies to conduct this survey. And what that survey turned up was that approximately 60% of those Vermonters with third-party charges from those carriers uh, on their cell phone bills during those two months they had been crammed. They didn't know the charges were there. They weren't availing themselves of those charges. And perhaps more compelling is the fact that 80% of those surveyed were not aware that charges on their cell phone bill were not exclusively for services provided by their own uh, carrier. So, and other AGs have found uh, similar results as they've looked at this, this issue in their states. Now, as uh, you and the ranking member have pointed out, there has been some progress in that the four uh, big carriers last November essentially got out of the PSMS uh, business and consequently complaints to us have, have sort of fallen off a cliff. Uh, but we're very much looking forward and wanting to uh, avoid recurrences of wireless cramming in the future and also be 
aware of new methodologies, new technologies, and opportunities for consumers to be scammed. Uh, so we want to protect uh, going forward. We also want to see that those uh, customers uh, who have been crammed are made whole uh, by their carriers, and we hope that there will be enhanced consumer education efforts to avoid recurrences going forward. Uh, this is a national problem. Uh, we very much hope that uh, the federal regulators will step up and be aggressive uh, and, if appropriate, that the Congress will uh, take action to better protect uh, American consumers uh, going forward. In the wireless arena, self-regulation has failed, and uh, with my federal partners in the Congress, we need to step up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, General Sorrell. Mr. LeBang. Senator Blumenthal, Ranking Member Thune, and Senator Johnson, my name is Travis LeBlanc. I am the Acting Chief of Enforcement at the Federal Communications Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you to highlight the FCC's efforts to deter, disrupt, and dismantle cramming, the fraudulent practice of placing unexpected or unauthorized charges on consumers' telephone bills. Cramming is a significant problem, causing countless consumers to unwittingly open their wallets for products and services they never wanted. A report released in 2011 by Chairman Rockefeller showed that phone companies placed approximately $2 billion in third-party charges on their subscribers' landline bills each year, and that most of these charges were unauthorized. In many of these cases, consumers were unaware that they had been crammed because charges were buried in multi-page bills, not clearly described, or small enough in amount to go unnoticed. As consumers embrace paperless billing and automated payments, the propensity increases for cramming to go undetected. Consumers' increased reliance on mobile phones makes the problem of cramming even thornier. Today, 90% of American adults have cell phones, and a majority own smartphones. These phones are used not only for calls, but also for a wide array of purchases in the real and virtual worlds. While the adoption of new mobile technologies and services presents exciting new opportunities for consumers, it also creates new opportunities for crammers, who, I should add, target not only adult consumers, but also children, small businesses, nonprofits, and religious organizations. We must make sure that our consumer protections keep up with new technologies and billing practices. Since 2010, of the thousands of cramming complaints the FCC has received, the proportion of those about unauthorized charges on wireless bills has grown from 15 to 58 percent. To be clear, these are complaints from consumers who believe they were crammed. Yet because so many consumers do not even know they've been crammed, these numbers are just the tip of the iceberg. As the federal agency with primary oversight of the nation's telephone carriers, the FCC has approached the problem of cramming comprehensively using a combination of enforcement, regulation, and consumer education. The Commission has taken 14 enforcement actions since 2010 against carriers for placing unauthorized charges on consumers' phone bills. These actions amount to approximately $123 million in monetary forfeiture settlements and refunds to injured consumers. Just in the last two weeks, we have taken three actions against carriers over, involving over $10.5 million in proposed penalties and payments to the Treasury. A prime area for mobile cramming enforcement involves carriers who have charged their own subscribers via premium text messages around $10 a month for unauthorized third-party services such as horoscopes and stock quotes. This is the alleged fraudulent activity at issue in the FCC's cramming investigation of T-Mobile and the Federal Trade Commission's complaint against it. We have no reason to believe that T-Mobile was the only carrier to engage in this conduct. To leverage our shared expertise and resources, the Federal Communications Commission worked collaboratively with the FTC on the T-Mobile investigation, and we look forward to continuing our partnerships with the FTC, state attorneys general, and other law enforcers in the future. We have also targeted our enforcement towards mobile and landline carriers who place unauthorized charges for their own services on customers' bills, and of course carriers who act as third-party crammers by placing unauthorized charges on other carriers' bills. This month, we entered into a $1.2 million settlement with Assist123 for allegedly placing unauthorized PSMS charges for subscription services like movie listings and lottery results on consumers' wireless and landline phone bills. On the regulatory side, the FCC adopted truth in billing rules 15 years ago designed to help consumers detect cramming or other fraud in connection with their telephone bills. 
The Commission has now asked whether it should prohibit carriers from billing for third-party products and services unless the subscriber expressly opts in, whether it should ban carriers from charging for any third-party products and services, and whether it should expand all of the existing truth in billing rules to wireless carriers so that third-party charges are more conspicuous to consumers. It is expected that the FCC will consider any rule changes within the next several months. On the education side, the FCC has been engaging consumers through written and video guides, tip sheets, and other materials aimed at empowering them to identify and report cramming. The Commission has also held a comprehensive public workshop on cramming in 2013, and to keep abreast of new and emerging kinds of cramming, as well as new carrier billing practices, the FCC is planning to host a workshop on similar event on these topics in the next six months. In sum, through its enforcement, regulatory, and consumer education efforts, the FCC is using its authority to protect consumers from these unauthorized charges, and we will continue to do so whenever and wherever crammers exploit innovative communications technologies, consumer trust, and the pocketbooks of American families. Senator Blumenthal, Ranking Member Thune, and members of the committee, it has been an honor to appear before you today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Alchul. Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Um, Ranking Member Thune and members of the committee, on behalf of CTI, I thank you for the opportunity to part Let me turn this on. I thank you for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing and address the steps the wireless industry has taken and is taking to address uh, cramming. At the outset, I want to be clear, CTI and its members uh, share the uh, committee's concern, regulators' concern, the public's concern about cramming. Placing an unauthorized, misleading, or deceptive third-party charge on a consumer's wireless bill is wrong and simply not acceptable. That's why, in November of 2013, wireless carriers ended their support of premium SMS uh, services, except for charitable and political giving and inmate calling services. Moreover, carriers allow customers to block all, all third-party charges and have worked to make it easier for consumers to obtain refunds for unauthorized or fraudulent charges. CTI originally became involved in the industry's efforts to police premium SMS um, through the association's role as the Common Short Code Administrator. As I think you know, Common Short Codes are used by commercial entities ranging from Dunkin' Donuts to Walmart, as well as by non-commercial entities including government, uh, charities, and political campaigns. From their start, um, users of common short codes issued by CTA have been subject to written, publicly available guidelines administered both by the Mobile Marketing Association and CTA. Not only do these guidelines reflect broadly accepted consumer best practices, uh, between 2008 and 2010, these guidelines were incorporated as industry requirements in a series of state consent actions. It is fair to say that CTA and its carrier members discovered that trust alone was not sufficient to ensure compliance with these guidelines. The industry stepped up its efforts from trust to trust but verify through industry and individual carrier monitoring of all short code campaigns. Uh, and then when fraudsters went to great lengths to evade these monitoring efforts, CTI added vetting to its monitoring efforts to confirm the identity of content providers and root out known offenders. Although the annual complaint rates published by the FCC, FTC, and provided by state attorneys generals did not suggest a significant problem in this area as a result of both its own investigations and the federal and state enforcement actions, the industry recognized that wireless customers and carriers were being victimized by determined fraudsters who crafted elaborate schemes to defeat the industry's self-regulation and third-party monitoring. Accordingly, wireless carriers chose to discontinue support for premium short code campaigns, as you, as you have noted, in late last year, except for the charitable and political campaign donations. CTA continues to uh, monitor and vet all common short code leases, le leases and lessees. When monitoring identifies a problem, that information is sent to the carriers so they may take corrective action. These efforts and the national carriers' decisions to end support for premium short code campaigns should combine to significantly reduce the opportunity for third parties to use carrier billing platforms as a tool to commit fraud. With the elimination of premium short codes for commercial campaigns, the remaining opportunities for third party charges to appear on wireless bills 
are limited to instances involving direct carrier billing. Although CTI has no direct involvement in this area, it is our understanding that each of the carriers employs stringent vetting and safeguards to guard against abuse of this process and as reported to this committee and included in the uh, staff report, uh, there have been very few consumer complaints associated with direct carrier billing and refund rates are around one to one and a half percent. As this committee's staff report recommends, the wireless industry is prepared to vigilantly monitor evolving third party billing practices to make sure that bad actors do not find ways to, uh, to penetrate barriers to cramming on direct carrier billing and other new systems, evaluate uh, consumer protection gaps that have occurred in the, in the context of landline and PSMS to establish consistent policies going forward that will provide consumers with appropriate transparency to the process and a clear avenue of recourse where unauthorized charges occur. Moreover, the wireless industry already has adopted many of the recommendations proposed by the Federal Trade Commission staff report, including giving consumers the option of blocking all third-party charges on their phone accounts, monitoring advertisements and vetting merchants to ensure that uh, advertising, marketing, and opt-in processes are not deceptive and the price information is clearly disclosed, in, uh, ensuring that consumers provide their express informed consent to charges before it's billed to their mobile bill, as well as investigating and taking appropriate action when consumer complaints indicate a merchant may be cramming charges. And we look forward to considering other ways to make third-party charges more clear and conspicuous on carrier bills and enabling consumers to dispute suspicious charges and obtain refunds for unauthorized charges through a clear and consistent dispute resolution process. So thank you again for this opportunity to address your concerns and address the steps the wireless industry has taken to safeguard wireless consumers from unauthorized, misleading, or deceptive charges. Thanks very much, Mr. Alchul. Uh, I have a few questions, and then I'll turn to uh, Senator Thune. Uh, as, as all of you are aware, the third-party <clears throat> wireless billing has involved three major players, the carriers, the third-party vendors, and the billing aggregators that act as middlemen. In this business, there's a lot of finger-pointing as to who is to blame, where the buck should stop, and law enforcement cases have now alleged wrong, wrongdoing at every stage of that billing process from vendors to billing aggregators to the recent action that you mentioned, Commissioner, by the FTC against uh, T-Mobile. But uh, all that finger pointing may not be of much benefit to consumers. So the, fa the question is, where should the buck stop? Uh, since the wireless carriers control the billing platform, and they have ongoing relationships with their customers, and they have been taking 3 to $4 out of every $10 vendors charge to consumers on this platform. Mr. Alshul, shouldn't the buck stop with the wireless carriers? The carriers uh, will take uh, responsibility for charges on their bills and urge their customers to look at their bills carefully and call the carrier if they have any questions or if they detect anything that's suspicious on a bill. If they were making less money, would there be a greater incentive to take stronger action? Well, the amount that is, is collected uh, has, as, as you know from the fact that the carriers have discontinued the service, has not um, um, you know, influenced the carriers' decisions to first and foremost protect their, their consumers. Uh, and the carriers, of course, whatever they choose independently to, to charge, uh, also have costs associated with providing the service. The carriers provide their own independent monitoring and vetting in addition to the industry's efforts. There are costs associated with uh, what they call onboarding and activating uh, these systems in their, uh, in their billing systems and, and maintaining support. So the, what's collected and, and, and what's kept uh, are, can be very different charges. Let me ask uh, the others on the panel whether that level of revenue and the percentage that the wireless carriers make on those charges serves and as, as a disincentive to take more effective action and conversely what kind of incentives 
would lead perhaps to the wireless carriers to take more effective action. Um, I'd start by saying I think in the Federal Trade Commission's view uh, that carriers and all of the uh, participants in the sector have a role to play here and that certainly we believe that um, while some steps are very promising that have been taken, there are additional steps that are necessary that should be taken to protect consumers. Um, as you point out, there's some question about whether there are perverse incentives here and I'd also add that I've seen estimates that direct carrier billing is expected to grow. So while PSMS may have stopped, there, there's certainly some prospect here for a very vibrant uh, direct carri carrier billing industry going forward. Accordingly, in our perspective, we think the carriers have a role to play in protecting consumers and improving the integrity of this kind of billing process, both by ensuring better uh, dispute resolution and consistent dispute resolution processes, but also making it clear to consumers that they can block third-party charges and taking steps to terminate merchants or scrutinize merchants that may be, uh, it may be involved in cramming and, and, um, and these kinds of unauthorized charges on their phone bills. General Sorrell. And thank you, Senator. First, in answer to your question, the buck stops with the carriers. There are others responsible, but that's where the uh, uh, the buck stops. It's the carriers that decided to con contract with the third-party providers and to pass along their bills, and as you suggested, keep 30 to 40 cents on the dollar of every uh, payment made by the carrier's customers. And... Uh, pleased to hear Mr. Altschul say that the carriers will take care of their customers when they call and, and question charges on their bills. But the reality has been very mixed in the past on this. Some carriers had a rather robust uh, reimbursement uh, mechanism. Others would uh, reimburse only two months, no matter how long the $9.99 to $20 or $29.99 a month was on carriers, on uh, customers' bills and uh, being paid. And some of the carriers referred their own customers to the third-party uh, providers. Uh, in my view, for recurring monthly charges, the carriers should be obligated to confirm their customers' consent to those billings. And I don't think there's any question but that uh, the hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, that the carriers have made as their share of their customers uh, being crammed is a huge incentive for them to look the other way. Mr. LeBanc, do you, do you want to add something? I'll keep it short. I will echo the comments of Commissioner McSweeney as well as General Sorrell and also just mention one further point, which is the carriers here actually are acting as the platform for these charges. And as the platform, they bear a responsibility to ensure that the conduct that's taking place uh, on their platform, that it is um, not deceiving and defrauding uh, their customers. So we completely agree with uh, our fellow law enforcement and uh, partners that the carriers bear accountability. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired. I'm going to come back to some of these questions and also give Mr. Altschul uh, an opportunity to respond if he wishes. And uh, I'll turn to Ranking Member Thune. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Sweeney, the FTC's complaint in the T-Mobile case states that the FTC and the FCC have concurrent enforcement jurisdiction over mobile telephone companies billing and collection of third-party charges for non-telecommunications services, but it doesn't cite to any authority for that statement. So given the so-called uh, common carrier exception, could you explain the authority for this claim in the FTC's complaint? The FTC has jurisdiction over carriers when they're engaged in non-common carrier activities, such as billing for third-party services, which is the conduct at issue in this case. It's established by the relevant case law. Are there other activities that the FTC might characterize as non-telecommunications activity by the carriers that the FTC would then claim jurisdiction over? Um, 
I would hesitate to give you an exhaustive list, but I imagine uh, hypotheticals in which carriers are billing for third-party services. For example, if a carrier wants to put uh, billing for a weight loss uh, product um, on their phone bill, then we would consider that kind of conduct covered by the FTC Act. Mr. LeBlanc, in your opinion, what independent agency is best equipped to regulate and enforce wireless cramming matters for telecommunications carriers? Well, as uh, Senator Blumenthal pointed out uh, at the beginning, there are a number of different entities that are involved in any cramming. There's the, uh, the third-party content providers, there's the aggregators, and there uh, as well are the carriers. Uh, at the FCC, we have primary jurisdiction over the carriers. We don't have the ability under our authority to reach the third parties, which the FTC, for example, does, as well as our partners at the state uh, level as well. So from our perspective, uh, we think that it's necessary that you have federal, uh, FTC, FCC, as well as state involvement to get to all three parties. But you would, you, in your view, though, the FCC is best equipped to deal with the carrier component of that? Uh, certainly on the regulatory side, there's no question about it, Senate Ranking Member Thune. Um, we are the only authority that has the ability to promulgate regulations to prevent um, and to respond to this on the rulemaking. On the enforcement side, uh, we have worked uh, very much over the last uh, four years, in fact, uh, in particular on cramming at the carrier uh, level, and we're going to continue to vigorously enforce in that area. Mr. Alshul, the chairman's report on wireless cramming discusses emerging third-party uh, wireless billing technologies such as the practice known as direct carrier billing. Um, is this direct carrier billing practice uh, being widely used by the wireless carriers? Uh, at present, the most um, popular and, and prevalent use is for um, billing for uh, purchases made on, on various um, web app stores, in, in particular Google Play. And um, when a customer goes to the Google Play Store, um, Google presents the customer with a number of payment opportunity uh, options, including credit cards and uh, direct carrier billing, and presents and walks the customer through a number of screens and disclosures to obtain their knowing consent to direct carrier billing. Should we be concerned that this practice will have the same risk of cramming that uh, for consumers as premium text messaging did? I think everyone needs to be vigilant uh, and to make sure that this remains a safe and trusted payment um, vehicle. But as you and others uh, have mentioned, as mentioned in, in the uh, reports that came out this week, uh, the Federal uh, Reserve Bank of Boston and others have noted that uh, there are many uh, consumers who are unbanked or underbanked and a mechanism such as direct carrier uh, billing provides a mechanism, another on, uh, another on ramp to many of these um, internet and information services. And uh, it appears that the burden's on the consumer to identify unauthorized charges on their bills. And the um, FTC, uh, their recently re released report, they recommended that when a carrier terminates, a third party's billing activities for unauthorized charges, the carrier also should notify consumers who incur charges from the third party to inform them about the termination so that they can request a refund. Um, what is CTI's response to this recommendation by the FTC, and, and, and should carriers uh, do more, such as sending an email or making a phone call to proactively alert customers of potentially fraudulent activity? Well, first, we endorse the recommendation. It seems to be universal that uh, customers need to look at their bills, whether they're paper, online, and be aware and, and be prepared to call and, and question any charges they don't recognize. Uh, second, with respect to carrier activities, I think the record in these reports shows that um, in, a, in a certain instances, carriers have done just that. Carriers actually are at a bit of a disadvantage in that um, they don't know which of their consumers may or may, may not have opted in to existing um, programs. Uh, you know, some of these programs may strike those of us in this room as not of much value, but not just in your home states, but at the Georgetown Safeway, take a look when you go through the uh, checkout counter at the horoscopes, the tabloids, 
the other magazines that sell exactly that, the same kind of content that had been marketed through um, these uh, carrier uh, billing mechanisms. And there is a legitimate um, interest among Mary, many Americans for these services. The carriers just are not in a, in a position to know who's been defrauded. Certainly they're not in as good a position as the customer when they look at their bill. But can, could, should they do more in, in the form of emails, phone alerts, um, just to be proactive? Well, again, in appropriate cases, they, they, they have done this, and they certainly uh, should continue to do it, yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman, thank you. So my time's expired. Thank you very much. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> Ms. McSweeney and Mr. LeBlanc, uh, both of you in your testimony talked about enforcement actions. Uh, so it sounds like this is being regulated, this is being enforced. Is there any authority that you do not have to conduct uh, proper enforcement. Uh, start with you, Ms. McSweeney. Uh, thank you, Senator. I, I think we are using the enforcement authority that we have appropriately to combat scammers, and we, we do have adequate authority. I'd note there's no civil penalty authority in this area for the FTC, but we have been able to take action to stop conduct and to get consumer redress. Mr. LeBlanc, do you feel you have full authority? Is there, is there anything else you would need in, in law? Senator Johnson, we are right now at the commission looking at promulgating revised rules with respect to cramming. Uh, those rules are asking questions about whether or not to block all third-party charges, whether to permit opt-in, whether, whether to apply the same uh, truth in billing rules that we use in the landline context to the wireless context. Uh, we look forward to the resolution of that in the next several months. That would, uh, presume, that would uh, offer us um, new opportunities to look at new avenues um, that we would have. But again, you're going to write the regulations. You believe you have the authority to, to write those regulations and enforce them? Yes. Mr. Altshaw, would, you, would, you, would the uh, industry challenge that uh, authority? We have filed comments questioning the FCC's existing authority over non-telecommunications services and billing for such services. Uh, I know some Mr. LeBanc's prepared testimony. He uh, rests his authority or the Federal Communications Commission's authority over billing in Title II of the Communications Act. Uh, that is the so-called common carrier provision, uh, and as Senator Thune um, raised in, in his questions, that, that does create a tension between the overlapping jurisdiction between the agencies here. So, so, so you would question the authority then that you know, in order to resolve this by regulation, there may be I th some, think that this is a law. without you know, detouring into the whole debate about net neutrality and what should be Title II and not Title II, uh, whether billing services for non-communication services are properly characterized as a communication service or not could stand to be clarified, yes. In both the testimony of uh, General Sorrell and I believe uh, Mr. LeBanc, uh, they both claimed that the majority of third-party charges were, were cramming. Uh, do you agree with that? Uh, I don't, uh, in my role in the association, have visibility into, uh, you know, the universe of, of, of charges, but no. Uh, I think that there uh, have been, been many, and I would say the majority of charges uh, have been uh, charges that consumers have accepted and opted into. And, uh, you know, I'm not denying that, th that there has been cramming and that any cramming is too much cramming. But you think that may be an overstatement that the majority of third-party char charges are, are cramming? That strikes me as an overstatement, yes. What, what type of standards or what type of screening do you, does, does the industry, do, do the carriers provide to try and limit this? Well, as uh, documented not just in my testimony, but in the, um, both the uh, Federal Trade Commission and Senate Commerce Committee staff reports that were released this week, uh, the industry... Uh, both through the association and individually, contracts with third-party auditors. The auditors do uh, three kinds of, of auditing of uh, every premium uh, SMS and standard SMS um, message. Uh, they monitor the marketing to make sure that the marketing has all the necessary disclosures, doesn't misuse the word free, um, and provides meaningful notice and opportunity to consent and opt Let me just stop. Those disclosures can be very long, right? 
Uh, they, they and, and prob prob probably contained in a very long statement that people just click. Well, the Federal Trade Commission actually has uh, has published some very helpful um, guidance on how to use the word free, how um, big the asterisk has to be, and we have boiled down these disclosures uh, so they can uh, fit on the first screen that the customer looks at. And uh, the Florida um, Assurance of Voluntary Compliance, which is a form of consent decrees, really specify how these uh, can be done in a way that at least the Florida AG thought would protect consumers. Okay, I interrupted you. I interrupted you. No, well, that's can the first you, uh, monitoring is, is media okay. monitoring. Second uh, monitoring is that for every uh, short code, and we now have the standard codes that are still being um, used on, on uh, the networks, uh, the monitoring firms uh, subscribe, they uh, make sure all the necessary disclosures if somebody sends stop to stop uh, a subscription service, that the service is stopped and the like, they do that on a monthly basis. And finally, uh, the industry has added uh, last year vetting of every applicant for a short code because we were uh, frankly um, deceived and, and burned by a scheme where uh, repeat offenders hid their identity, went around the United States. Uh, used mailbox, um, um, post office boxes, and employee names rather than corporate names to get additional codes when their prior codes have been cut off. So now we confirm that every applicant is a brick and mortar operation. We can find them in established directories on the internet and, and so on. So those are the three kinds of monitoring the industry does for SMS messages. And I understand uh, it's very similar to the monitoring carriers are doing for direct carrier billing. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks very much. Uh, Senator Nelson. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, just so you know where I'm coming from, as the former elected regulator of insurance products in Florida, uh, I actually worked with our fraud division uh, against insurance companies that uh, build for, charge for insurance services that the customer did not ask for, could not afford. Uh, and as a result, we sent some people to jail. Now, you need to know where I'm coming from, so I don't have a lot of patience when I hear on somebody's wireless service that they're getting billed for things. Uh, it seems like that they don't want or don't know about. Now, could we require consumers to affirmatively opt in to allow third-party billing of services at the time they execute a contract for wireless services? What do you think? Well, Senator, I, I think it's a great question. I would point out that in the Federal Trade Commission's view, we think there are a lot of legitimate uses for mobile carrier billing and that many consumers will want to take advantage of them. What's very important here, though, is that consumers have adequate information, that they understand clearly that they have the right, uh, in many cases, to block third-party charges from a phone if they'd like to, and that they be able to take a look at their bill and understand where the third-party charges are and who they're from. And very often, they really don't have adequate transparency to see that the, the charge is unrelated to their phone service, so it's difficult to identify on the bill. And the information isn't clearly presented uh, around rights to, to block uh, third-party charges. I'd also note that there's inconsistent dispute resolution among the carriers when customers do identify problems. Uh, so we really are urging clearer and more consistent dispute resolution, which would be consistent with the kinds of measures that are present in other industries. Do you think there ought to be an independent consumer ombudsman at, the, at your agency to resolve consumer complaints? I, I think it's a very interesting proposal and one that I'd have to give more thought to. At the moment, I think the Commission is doing a good job using its enforcement powers to go after scammers where we see them, to respond quickly to consumer complaints, and to provide consumer education material, which I think is very, very valuable. Uh, it is important for people to understand that 
uh, right now they're their first line of defense against these kinds of practices. Uh, that if you see something on your bill that you don't understand, you can contact your carrier, you can contact the FTC, and we will respond. I'm not sure that there is enough public awareness, and that's one of the reasons, thanks to the chairman and Chairman Rockefeller and the ranking member, that we're having this hearing. What do you think about an independent ombudsman, Mr. LeBanc? Uh, the independent ombudsman is a, a very interesting idea, Senator. Uh, the concern that we see right now from the enforcement perspective at the FCC is that consumers don't have substantial protections when it comes to dispute resolution. In the credit card industry, for example, if a consumer has a dispute about something on their credit card bill, they have certain rights. They have a right to dispute the billing errors by notifying the credit card companies. They can uh, have a right to withhold payment for damaged goods, for example. Here, there are no such rights when they have an actual concern about something. And so having an ad, you know, it, it is helpful certainly to have uh, an an additional person, an ombudsman, or the FTC, the FCC, state attorneys general, uh, state public utilities commissions that are there that they can go to to complain when they believe that they've been charged for unauthorized charges. When you have that many choices, I can't keep up with that. And that's, that's only one. I can go to the next one. Uh, let me give you an example. A $9.99 a month charge for daily horoscopes or celebrity gossip. It was very cleverly designed. It's small enough that consumers may have missed it when they were paying their bill. And taking $9.99 from consumers month after month really adds up. So when you multiply these charges across millions of customers, you can see how this can become such a big industry. Uh, so commissioners, tell me, uh, would any of you want to comment about how a small charge like $9.99 or less a month can make a big uh, impact on consumers? I think it absolutely does make a big impact, especially as you point out, uh, it's very easy for consumers to rack up these charges month after month before even recognizing that they're being crammed, if they do at all. And in some cases, the charges uh, may be more than $9.99, or a consumer may be experiencing crammers, cramming from more than one third party. We've had recent cases where we have indications that more than a million consumers have been charged, and there have been hundreds of millions in consumer harm associated with the conduct. So I think it's very significant, sir. I would add to that, Senator, that in 2011, uh, Chairman Rockefeller released a report on cramming that found that it added up to $2 billion annually. That is a lot of money. A lot of Americans in this country live paycheck to paycheck. These charges we're finding are ones that very few people even notice. Many people aren't even aware that third-party billing is possible on their credit, on their uh, telephone bill. Um, so we have, it is of great concern that 999 adds up and they're unable to actually get all of these removed if they catch it two, three, four years down the road. Our One solution which the Federal Trade Commission report recommends and the industry uh, supports is to move the disclosure and consent process away from the merchant and uh, to the aggregator or the carrier so that there's clear responsibility uh, for obtaining and maintaining um, the record of the customer's consent uh, to be uh, charged for whatever service um, is on their bill. That sounds like a good suggestion. What do you think, General Sorrell? I'm not so sure about the aggregator. I think the buck, as I said earlier, the buck stops with the carrier. And for recurring charges, I think the carrier should be the one to have to uh, confirm the consent. Uh, 
But, you know, qu quite apart from putting these third-party charges in a separate section of the bill so someone knows uh, that it's a service that's not afforded by the carrier, for the real scam artists, they had uh, names like Text Savings or Text Savings LLC. And I think the worst case I've heard, or maybe the best, depending on your perspective, with the Texas uh, AG's office found a, a bill that uh, the third party bill was, quote, refund. So for those minority of consumers who are aware that third party charges may be on their bill, these scam artists were masking what they were doing with what they put on the bill, and the carriers took a blind eye in passing along refund on their customers' bills when it wasn't a refund, it was a charge. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Nelson. Senator Markey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much, and thank you for holding today's uh, very important um, hearing. So let's be clear, the practice of cramming, forcing consumers to pay for fraudulent charges on their phone bills costs consumers dearly. Cramming is wrong, cramming is scamming, it is that simple. Our focus today should be entirely on how to stop fraud now and in the future. My first question, we are talking a lot today about cramming on wireless phone bills, which is very important. But what about the potential for abuse on broadband bills or on bills for bundled services where consumers pay for telephone, broadband, and TV in one bill. Plenty of opportunity for cramming and scamming. Um, Mr. LeBlanc, is the FCC taking steps to look into whether broadband, bundle services, uh, is an emerging problem today? Uh, Senator Markey, uh, crammers are predators. They evolve with consumers. Wherever consumer bills are, they are likely to try to pop up if, they're allow if third party charges are allowed. Uh, we are trying to keep up and get in front of the crammers as they evolve. Uh, there's no question that uh, to the extent that um, we are look, talking about wireless bills today, which include uh, mobile broadband uh, as part of the bill, that the uh, investigation we have uh, into T-Mobile, as well as uh, the Assist 123 case that we recently did uh, this month, uh, show that there are concerns on wireless bills. And so we, are you looking, are you, is the FCC looking right now at your rules, your enforcement strategies, uh, with regard to bundled services, broadband, telephone, TV, and then the cramming that occurs as part of the bill. Are you looking at that right now? Uh, we just put out last week an enforcement advisory about uh, transparency and the commercial terms of service around mobile and broadband. And, and broadband. And broadband. And we uh, indicated that we are going to focus enforcement in that area. Okay. Uh, Ms. McSweeney, do you want to talk about what the Federal Trade Commission is doing with regard to broadband uh, cramming. I, I would say I think the Federal Trade Commission believes that we have the authority to take action to protect consumers from uh, fraud and from unfair practices. And um, we believe that, that these protections extend um, to the mobile environment um, and, and beyond, um, just as they exist in the brick and mortar world. Um, Mr. Sorrell, we have, you know, industries that take uh, action to put voluntary guidelines on the books, which are always good for good people. You know, they don't have the murder statute on the books for my mother or yours. They're not going to be committing murders, only for the bad people. That's why you have laws on the books. And so how do you feel about that as 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 to its adequacy of ensuring that the bad actors in this space aren't still free because uh, aren't still free to act in anti-consumer ways, uh, knowing that any sanction is voluntary and industry driven rather than having a governmental um, uh, sword uh, behind uh, the threat if they violate the, um, the consumer uh, protections to which we're trying to advance. 
self, uh, thank you, Senator, but self-regulation in Vermont's experience didn't work in the landline cramming arena, and it has not worked in the, in the wireless arena. Uh, uh, it, where there are bad actors, there must be regulatory efforts to identify them and hold them uh, accountable. Uh, I want to give you, Mr. Altschul, a chance to talk about that issue, voluntary versus mandatory, and ensuring that all the good, just so that all the good players in the wireless sector aren't tarred by the actions of a few. And thank you, Senator. Uh, well, first, I couldn't agree more that these crammers and fraudsters are predatory and they do move from one service to another as, as one door is shut, they, they try, try another. Uh, we do support voluntary efforts. Our, our experience with hindsight always being 2020 is a, we built a wall. Bad guys came over it with a ladder. We raised the wall. The bad guys came back with a taller ladder and so on and so forth. So I think that, that uh, with that experience, uh, the industry is responsible for protecting its consumers in the first instance. Uh, there's no shortage of uh, enforcement uh, agencies at the federal and state level. They've, they've said today, and, and we know from their enforcement actions, they are, are energetic. They have ample enforcement authority to go after bad guys. And uh, we support that. In fact, the industry and the association has assisted them in those efforts. Okay. Look, may I ask one final question, Mr. Chairman? Thank you. Um, and it's a related subject, and it is that uh, I am the uh, House author of the Telephone Consumer Protection Act of 1991, and I feel as strongly today as I did two decades ago that consumers should not be subject to intrusive calls from telemarketers, whether they are at home or on their mobile phones. By banning most auto dial and uh, pre-recorded calls to landlines and mobile phones and establishing the do not call list, which I'm very proud of, the law created a zone of privacy that remains popular with consumers to this day. As a matter of fact, every consumer, every time they get a call from somebody they don't know, they say, how do they get my number? Huh? So they're conditioned now to think that they don't have um, uh, a right to, uh, uh, to call someone who is not receptive to it. For the Federal Trade Commission and the FCC, please tell me about your efforts to enforce this law and keep up with the changing technologies that seek to circumvent these protections. It seems to be increasing as a problem once again. Senator Markey, I recognize that you were the driver of the do not call law and thank you for your commitment to it. Uh, there's no question that today even the number one, the number one complaint that we get at the FCC is do not call, by far consumer complaints. Uh, we just recently, in the last three months, took the largest enforcement action uh, uh, under Do Not Call that we've taken in our history, we, where we've uh, settled the case for $7.5 million with the carrier, and we continue to aggressively enforce uh, the TCPA there, as well as in the, the robocall context. To be even more aggressive. I think it really ticks people off. Uh, Ms. McSweeney? I would, as Senator, I would just second um, our appreciation for the TCPA as an important and pro-consumer law, and I'd add that to the extent that um, we are very proud of our track record on Do Not Call at the FTC. We have more than 200 million people signed up, I think, by last count, and um, take the responsibility of continuing to protect those consumers very seriously. We are trying to work with technologists to address the robocall problem that typically tries to thwart the do not call registry and we're taking new steps to uh, try to address those issues. And if I could just say this, we all grew up kind of conditioned to our phone in our living room ringing and it could be something soliciting us and we have a law saying don't solicit anymore. But when your cell phone rings, you're saying to yourself, well, the only people who have my number are my family and my friends. How did you get my number? You know, and, uh, and it just ticks people off. So the more aggressive you can be, as I think the happier the American people will be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Klobuchar, I am sure, has some questions. I'll just give her a chance to be Thank seated. You. And if you like, I can fill in time or I can yield to you. Well, if you're just filling in, I can handle it. I've got some questions. Oh, why don't you go ahead? Okay. Uh, you know, I think that uh, this testimony has been very valuable, and I want to elaborate on some of the questions that have been asked. Uh, 
First of all, uh, the comparison inevitably has to be made to the uh, other payment mechanisms that encounter similar problems with unauthorized charges. And they voluntarily, uh, for example, credit card networks typically investigate merchants when there are chargebacks, when there are requests for refunds above a certain rate. In other words, for any one of these chargers, uh, whether valid or invalid, if there are refund requests above a certain rate, they investigate. For the credit card networks, that threshold is 1%. For the uh, wireless carriers, my understanding is that it's 10 times as high, 10% or higher, which indicates a much less vigorous level of vigilance. I think you mentioned, uh, Commissioner, that you thought greater scrutiny was one answer here. And perhaps that is what you meant by that answer. You didn't elaborate on it, but you do in your testimony mention those numbers. And uh, uh, I'm wondering whether perhaps you can elaborate on that point. I think it's a very important point. And in some of our cases, we've actually seen uh, refund requ rate requests at 40%, which is, as you point out, uh, significantly higher than um, uh, you see in other industries. So we do think that there needs to be uh, much more scrutiny, um, both by intermediaries and by carriers of merchants that uh, have high refund rates, and a much more consistent and uh, aggressive approach to terminating those merchants or um, reviewing their activities. Mr. Mr. Altschul, doesn't that make sense to you that uh, there should be investigative efforts, intense scrutiny when refunds well, I agree. are higher than one or two percent. I agree, and uh, actually, the statements of the state AG in, in Texas thank the industry for working with the state's efforts uh, in the um, cases that uh, that attorney general um, brought. And I would point out that now well, the premium SMS. The industry practice is very different. From well, that one instance. The, Why it not the committee be staff's better? own report released today indicates that for direct carrier billing, for charitable um, campaigns, it's 1% or less, and for direct carrier billing, it's 1% to 1.5%, which is in the range that you've described for credit card um, uh, investigations. Well, I want to come back to uh, this area of questioning, uh, but I'll yield to Senator Klobuchar. Oh, thank you very much, Senator Blumenthal. Thank you for holding this hearing, and thank you, Senator. Thune. Uh, two years ago, as I know you have discussed, I'm sorry I was away chairing a hearing, um, contact lenses actually, um, uh, with the, the antitrust subcommittee. But two years ago, the FCC finally took additional regulatory action on wireline cramming, following up on pressure from this committee. And uh, one of the things that I was concerned about at the time, while well, I thought the action was important, that there weren't protections put in place for wireless. Uh, customers. And as I said in my filing at the FCC at the time, quote, with more and more households cutting the cord on their landline phones, the FCC should take all necessary steps to prevent crammers from finding new opportunities with wireless bills. While I'm encouraged that the FCC recently refreshed its record on truth and billing regulations in relation to wireless protections, we need to continue to look for ways to address the current and future evolution of crammers and action that need to be taken. I'm a co-sponsor of Senator Rockefeller's Fair Telephone Billing Act, which would address cramming, as we know, on wireline phones. And I hope this committee can work together to pass this legislation and continue to look at action on wireless cramming as well. Um, I guess I'll start uh, well, with you, uh, Mr. LeBlanc, and uh, um, as well as uh, Mr. Sorrell. Uh, in 2012, the FCC updated its truth in billing rules, which included protections for consumers from wireline cramming, as I just noted. However, the argument was made that there was not enough evidence of cramming on wireless. Two years later, it's extremely clear that wireless cramming is a huge problem, and the FCC still, CC still has not expanded cramming protections for wireless. 
Um, Mr. LeBlanc, will the FCC take regulation uh, at regulatory action this year to protect wireless consumers from cramming? And what about some kind of additional enforcement action? Uh, thank you, Senator Klobuchar, and thank you very much for your comments uh, as well that you've uh, filed with the FCC over the last couple years. Um, the record in that matter closed in December of 2013, and we anticipate uh, that it will be ready for uh, a decision within the next several months. So we are hopeful that we will see uh, a change. Uh, some of the issues that are presented to the Commission right now involve whether all third-party charges should be banned entirely. Um, also, whether or not whether we should have an opt-in uh, process, and then finally, uh, ensuring that the truth in billing rules that apply in the landline context also apply in the wireless context. So that it is right right now for a decision, and we hope to have an answer within the next several months. On the enforcement side, uh, we are vigorously tailoring our enforcement resources towards the matters that matter, towards the issues that affect average Americans today in the 21st century, and there's no question that the wireless space and cramming concerns in that space are those issues. We've just recently announced the investigation of T-Mobile, and we have no reason to believe that T-Mobile was the only wireless carrier that was engaging in cramming. Okay. Thank you. I re and I was aware of that action. Thank you. Uh, Attorney General, uh, do you think the, the, uh, sh there should be more action here on the federal level or on the wireless issue? Thank you, uh, Senator. Uh, as the lead state of a 47-state effort to try to address... That would be called a softball. <laughs> but I already hit it earlier before you came in, uh -huh. so, I, so I'll just hit it again. It's a huge, huge problem, and uh, there is some good news in that the major carriers have gotten out of the PMS, PSMS uh, business, and complaints to us have uh, fallen off at the, at the state level about wireless cramming, but now our focus is one, trying to make our constituents who have been crammed whole for the wrongs of the past, but also to work with uh, federal regulators to assure that there's not a recurrence of wireless cramming or uh, a close cousin using uh, new technologies going forward. Um, and then, uh, Commissioner Sweeney, uh, you mentioned your testimony, as did the Attorney General, that consumers are not aware that their cell phone carriers are able to add third-party charges to their bills and that they are not checking their bills, which is always an issue. Um, I remember doing an event on this in Minnesota, and I, I found, like, some math teacher, of course, checked his bill and figured it out. But how long do you think it, and a Lutheran minister, he also checked. <laughs> how long do you think it takes the average consumer to notice an unauthorized charge uh, on their account, and how are you working to better inform consumers, and how underreported do you think wireless cramming is? I think um, the six cases that the FTC has brought so far are to address mobile cramming, and I would say stay tuned, I'm sure we'll have more, indicate two things that are very important here. One, that the vast majority of customers who have been crammed don't realize it. So uh, we are, I think, seeing this proverbial tip of the iceberg. Uh, and two, that um, people really are having a hard time getting redress um, and uh, getting refunds if they are lucky enough to identify charges that may be on their accounts. So we think consumer education is very important. We have consumer education materials available, but as you point out, they recommend people review their bill and try to identify any charges that they don't understand. This can be very complicated, and in most cases, identifying third-party charges on bills is almost impossible. They generally look like phone bill charges. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we recommend people take that step. We hope they do. We are available as a resource at the FTC. Of course, the FCC is a resource as well as our state attorney generals. And um, we're urging industry to really take a look and try to make these kinds of third-party services more clear uh, to consumers on their bills. Do you know what the average uh, charge is for one of these, these cramming, uh, whether it's wireline or wireless, um, what do you think the costs are? I know it's hundreds of millions of dollars, but, you know, how often do they get the full refund? And 
Well, so what we typically see are um, subscription services that range from $9.99 to $14.99 a month. Mm -hmm. But again, people can be crammed by multiple third parties, so they may have more than just that $9.99. And very often, it takes some time for them to even realize it's occurring to them, so it can occur and, ac and accumulate over a matter of months or even years. We've heard uh, cases and had cases where people tried to get refunds um, and um, you know, have not succeeded or have only gotten a couple of months worth so that is a significant problem all right well we encourage you to keep working on this um, I just I think you know um, Attorney General our Attorney General of Minnesota Lori Swanson has been very aggressive about these cases and uh, worked hard on them and we've done some of this work together so uh, and I'm glad that uh, Senator Blumenthal as a former Attorney General understands how important it is as well so we'll continue to push on this issue but thank you very much all of you for being here uh, returning, returning to the question that I was about to ask you, um, and I appreciate your comment that uh, your belief is that there are investigative efforts in some areas after the threshold reaches uh, a percentage and a half. Uh, I take it then that you wouldn't object to a requirement that there be investigative scrutiny after, let's say, a 2%. Uh, the right. devil's always in the details. It's certainly not. Uh, well, what details? I'm certainly willing to, to um, you know, look, look into it. One of the interesting things in the Vermont um, Consumer Survey that Attorney General Sorrell uh, mentioned, and it was filed in the FCC docket, is how often uh, in the customer responses you discover that a lot of these charges were what sometimes are called teachable moments in families with family plans. And the survey response indicates that um, a child of, uh, on, on a family plan uh, made a charge without the parents' consent. This is a, a serious issue. It's uh, in violation of FCC, uh, FTC uh, rules, though maybe not COPPA because the users may be over 13. Uh, so not all of the uh, refunds uh, are attributed to lack of knowledge, just maybe perhaps, as I said, lack of adult supervision. So that's why um, a refund rate per se is a very crude metric. And if that's the metric, you may find carriers being less liberal with their refund policies to stay under that line. And that's not a, a desire that the industry wants, and I'm sure the committee wants. I wouldn't set the threshold at the level of refunds, I would set it at the level of requests for refunds. And I take it that you would not, barring viewing some of the details, object to, let's say, two or three percent? No. In, in fact, the actual uh, numbers in the, in the public record from the uh, monitoring or the reports received by the FCC and Federal Trade Commission and the state AGs over a period of four years are below that number. And yet that number, as we've heard today, doesn't necessarily indicate the scope of the problem. So that's why the devil is in the details. Okay. Well, maybe we'll work on some of the details. Comparing, again, the uh, consumer disputes in uh, this area as compared to uh, some others, as you know, uh, when a consumer disputes a vendor charge on their phone bill, uh, they have uh, far less protections, far fewer protections than a consumer who disputes a credit card charge. Uh, those consumers have a statutory right to reasonable investigation of the dispute, and they can't be penalized for a bad credit report for failing to pay the charge during the investigation, unlike uh, consumers who dispute a vendor charge on a phone bill. Uh, let me ask the uh, members of the panel uh, whether perhaps those same protections in the credit card or credit charge area should be extended to charges on phone bills. In, in my view, that makes sense, Senator. I'd note that the FTC's view uh, is to suggest continued voluntary uh, regulation at this point and a series of steps that we believe the industry and carriers should take. 
I would say in my own personal view, I would uh, be very interested in, in working with you on that issue. Thank you. Ms. Senator, I would echo um, both my, uh, both General Sorrell as well as Commissioner McSweeney and say that those uh, uh, is a squarely a policy question that should definitely be considered. And if I might add. Um, yes, please. Well, I'm not an expert in, in payment mechanisms. I'm, I am sufficiently aware that it's a mess of different levels of protection. And if this committee and, and, and Congress uh, has the appetite, what they should do is take on the entire range of credit cards, debit cards, prepaid cards, uh, charges to all kinds of uh, additional third-party mechanisms because uh, the current landscape is, is a, a total uh, mess of different and sometimes conflicting rights and obligations. Well, uh, I'm not sure how to interpret that answer. You would not object, but only if it, well, it, it is it, more far-reaching? You've, you've chosen to compare um, the credit cards with the Regulation Z's uh, protections that consumers have. That's just one of the existing regulatory schemes uh, that exists for, for payment mechanisms today. There are other payment mechanisms which exist, uh, which uh, have very similar um, rules and regulations as carrier billing, uh, which, as we've heard today, the uh, Federal Trade Commission and, and Federal Communication Commission overseas. Well, let me, let me take another area that is very comparable to yours. In the landline industry, uh, industry members have stated that consumers can withhold payment on disputed charges. Is that true in the wireless area? Uh, it is not part of the FCC's truth and billing rules, and that was because the FCC found that uh, wireline service, at least at the time, uh, was uh, something that uh, households had and, and had a right to without interruption. Uh, wireless, uh, there were additional choices and very low barriers to getting additional wireless service. Would you object to that rule as applied to your industry? Well, once again, the devil is in, in, in the details, but certainly it's something that I think the industry would be uh, open to uh, discussing. Uh, do you, by the way, have uh, evidence that you could give us? I, I know you disputed the contentions made by the members of the panel that the majority of charges are unrequested. Do you have uh, facts or data or studies that you could submit? I do not. Um, the, um, the one study that, as we all know, that is, is in the record is from Vermont. Uh, our association has filed some comments in the FCC docket just pointing out some of the flaws in, in that study. But that study itself um, indicates uh, that there are a, a lot of reasons, a lot of inconsistent reasons why uh, these charges uh, show up on customer bills. Do you have a number that you can attribute to unauthorized or un I do not. So on what basis are you disputing that the majority are unrequested or unauthorized? Be, as I um, believe I represented, it's, it's my belief based on, on my experience and experience of, of you know, my, my um, peers and, and friends that uh, the charges that the majority of charges on customer bills are charges that customers have opted into and consented to. I know I've looked at, at my charges. I hope you have looked at your bills as well. Uh, you, uh, you describe this problem as uh, de minimis, I think, uh, before the FTC, not all that long ago. We describe the number of complaints received by the FCC as de minimis. Do you still believe it's de minimis? Based on the, what we said at the time, the number of complaints reported by the agencies remain de minimis. The scope of the problem um, has uh, been demonstrated to be significant, and that's why the industry uh, has discontinued their support of premium SMS uh, charges. You agree, you agree that it is significant? Significant, yes. Um, General Sorrell, uh, I'm not sure whether it has been mentioned yet, but uh, I think you did in your testimony say that in Vermont, uh, these third-party charges were actually banned by statute on landline. On landline, calls. yes, Senator. 
uh, in your testimony, you also call for a, and I'm quoting, new approach. Uh, what about the idea of banning third-party charges on wireless? I think given what's happening in the marketplace and how smartphones, I believe, are now a majority of cell phones in America, that uh, I'm concerned that an outright ban would have unintended consequences that might well be harmful to uh, consumers. Uh, the uh, An opportunity for one uh, to block all third-party charges uh, on their on their phone or to block certain types of charges makes sense to me but I would be concerned that if I took the position that what we've done in landlines should also apply to the wireless arena that uh, although it would take care of a lot of bad actors actions by a lot of bad actors that it might her, uh, also tend to harm consumers in the economy going forward. Well, I, I tend to agree with you. I don't know whether any other uh, members of the panel would have observations. Uh, I, I would agree and second what the Attorney General said. I think from the FTC's perspective and certainly my personal perspective, there are a lot of innovations in mobile carrier billing it, right now that are very beneficial to consumers. And um, at the moment, one of the primary gaps here is the fact that consumers may have the ability to even block but don't know that they can block these third-party transactions if they wish to. Again, they may not wish to because they may be taking advantage of that service, but then it can be very difficult for them to see where the third-party charges are showing up in their bills. And as we've discussed, they don't have the same consistent dispute resolution uh, procedures available to them should they wish to dispute the charges. Uh, I'm going to turn to Senator Klobuchar. I apologize. I didn't know that you had more. No, I'm Sorry. just listening. <laughs> Believe it or not. <laughs> the usual line in the Senate, everything's been said, but I haven't said it. <laughs> I'm, I'm not using that today. <laughs> You've been saying everything in a very good way. Thank you. Uh, I have just a few more questions. Um, the Commission actually has advocated, as you point out in your testimony, that consumers have the right to block these charges on a selective basis, uh, in part perhaps to avoid the kind of teaching moments that uh, Mr. Altschul has raised. Uh, that was done, I think that recommendation was made back in 2012. Uh, can you bring us up to date as to what the FTC's position is now? It's my understanding that, uh, and uh, defer to Mr. Altschul on this, that most of the carriers provide this as an option. But, and we articulate this in the report we released this week, very few consumers are aware of it, and the information about the option isn't readily available. So the FTC does include it in consumer education materials, and we think it's a valuable option, especially perhaps if you want to make sure that uh, a phone a young person in your family has access to can't uh, include third-party charges on it. Um, but it's, it isn't uh, widely used, and I think it's because people really don't understand that it's available or what it even means. A lot of these issues really seem to come back to consumers knowing what they're doing, paying attention, being educated. And uh, I hope that this hearing will play at least some part in raising awareness, but I think with all uh, due modesty, uh, outside of this building, outside of Washington, D.C., there are probably very few people who will be watching their bills more closely simply because we had this hearing today. And so I think there are a number of areas where we can work together to ensure that consumers are not only educated but better protected. And uh, General Sorrell uh, has uh, very commendably and interestingly suggested that a new approach is necessary in this area. And I would welcome more specific ideas from the state attorneys general, from the FTC and the FCC, and of course from the industry, as to how we can do better. And um, if there are no other questions from the panel, um, 
we will keep the record open for two weeks. Uh, I want to thank the staff uh, uh, for its really excellent work on the report that was released today. It is a profoundly important document. And uh, rather than listen to me talk about it, I hope people will read it. I hope the American public looks at it. I hope it gains greater currency because it is uh, truly eye-opening and important. So um, the record will remain open for two weeks. We welcome other comments. And with that, the hearing is adjourned.